My name is David Calavera, um, and of course I'm going to talk about Atom Publishing Protocol and how to test your server implementation. So first of all, a little bit out of me. Uh, I'm from Spain. Uh, I work in a company called 11870.com or 11870.com or what do you want. Uh, I also contribute to several open source projects like Hudson or NetBeans. And I'm a committer of the Apache Dart project. So this is the agenda for today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to give you some background information on Netum Publishing Protocol. Yeah. Sorry. I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> 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 so, uh, well, then we talk about some some stuff that we should take a look at, and and finally, I I like to show you some useful tools to test Atom servers. So, uh, how many of you are familiar with Atom Publishing Protocol? Well. So, well, I, I have three zero questions. How many of you are familiar with Atom Feeds? Yeah. And how many of you are familiar with HTTP? <laughs> well, I, I have, I think it's the most difficult question I've never asked. How many of you are not familiar with XML? Let me say. So that's what I'm, I'm talking about. I'm talking about how to test HTTP. I'm talking about how to test XML. And I'm talking about how to test Atom syndication format. So this is just an introduction to the protocol specification. As it will cover pretty much everything, you can get more in-depth details if you read the RFC 5023. So, What's Atom Publishing Protocol? It's a simple protocol for publishing content on the web. It was originally designed for weblogs, but as we'll see, it can also be applied to other areas. So yeah, it uses Atom syndication format. So resources are represented as Atom entries, and groups of resources are represented as Atom feeds or collections. And it doesn't only allow, allow us to publish plain content. It also defines the way of managing other types of elements, like media files, or binary files, or anything. So we can find some examples. Uh, if we use WordPress, um, we can manage our blogs with an Atom Path API. Or if we use Mule Galaxy as a SOA governance platform, we can manage all of our services with, with another AtomPath API. And of course, most of the Google APIs are built on Atom Publishing Protocol, uh, because API, Blogger API, YouTube Data API are built on Atom Publishing Protocol. Okay, so it works over HTTP, and it's a REST-based protocol. So we need to find out how the most common HTTP method works. And we'll see how, how to use the POS method in order to create new resources, and how to retrieve them through the get method, how to modify elements through the put method, and finally, how to use the delete method to remove these resources. And of course, AtomPub uses XML, so it's also an extensible protocol. And furthermore, since people started to use it outside weblogs, they've created a, a bunch of, of extensions in order to complement the few elements that Atom format offers. 
So we can find an open source board or URS support, or one of the most recent internet drafts, the Atompub multipart media creation, that allow us to create resources sending multiparted files. So let's look at how Atompub actually works. It was designed as an introspective protocol. So all we need is a URL in order to work with it. This URL will be the endpoint to the service document. And this document defines the available collection fits that we can work with. It also defines what kind of data we can retrieve or add to a specific collection. And on top of this, it will show us how we can categorize a document and it's one of its elements. So once we've got the service document and the collections URL that we are going to use, we're going to start working. So in order to create a new resource, we have to send an entry to the collections URL using the post method. And if it was created successfully, the server should respond with a status code of 201, an allocation header that contains the URI of the new resource. So later, if we want to retrieve a particular resource, we can use that location header that we got, or we can use the, the added link that we'll find in each one of the elements. Or if, is, if the post response contains the location and the content location headers, and both are equal, it means that we have received the complete resource and we can, go, we can use it. So, but there is no way we'll post the feed and extract an entry because the server is not required to, to send us completely entries when we retrieve a collection feed. So these URLs are also useful if we want to modify or remove our resource. If we want to change it, we'll send a put with a modified entry. And, but to get rid of it, we just need to send a delete. And if everything goes well, the server will respond with status code of 200. So that's how an AtomPub server works. But uh, when we work with media resources, the server behavior is slightly different. So we, we have to take a look how, how the server works. It has to store a reference of the resources and their metadata. So once we create a new media resource, the entry you got with the location headers has two edit links. The edit media link points to the resource that we send, but the edit link points to the entry that stores the metadata. So therefore, to modify the resource, we we'll send a put to the edit media URL. But to modify the metadata, we have to send a put to the edit URL. And finally, to remove a, a media resource, we'll send a delete to the edit URL rather than the edit media URL. And both the resource of the media and the media link entry will, will be removed. So that's how Atompub actually works. But let's make sure it's working properly. So when we test AtomPub and other HTTP-based standards, one of the most important things we need to check is the response status code. So we have to solve questions such as, what happens when the server doesn't allow to modify or remove resources? Or what happens when we send a, a resource that the collection doesn't accept? So a, a bunch of the most useful status codes. So can anyone help me? Can anyone tell me what all they mean? Uh, 
409. Sorry? No. <laughs> it's a conflict. Any more? 301? Move it permanently. And 405? No. Method not allowed. <laughs> Pat request? Yeah. What? 400. 400. <laughs> Internal server error. Yeah. 200? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, next. <laughs> so we have to pay attention to cache controls. Item path uses entity tags, and it means that clients are not assured to receive the most recent collection members. So once, we, once a new resource is done, the server will send the header e tag, and we have to, to use the value of of this header to send conditional request. So if the entry hasn't been modified and we send a get with the header if not match, the server must respond with status code of 304. And on the other hand, if the entry has been modified and we send a put with the header if match, it has to respond with a status code of 412. So, <laughs> another control share point <laughs> is atom identifiers. So, every entry must have a global unique ID, and they have to carry three requirements out. They must be a valid URI, they must be globally unique uh, across all atom feeds, anywhere, at any time, and they must never change. So if the same entry appears in two different feeds, it must have the same ID. And there are no exceptions. So we can use our entry URL because we have got our three requirements. Well, it's valid, it's unique, and it shouldn't change, or should it? So Actually, it's kind of possible for it to change. So if we are building, for example, some kind of application, like a block system, where our URLs are made for, from dynamic content, our IDs cannot change if our URLs change. But so to me, UUID is a pretty efficient way to solve the IDs issues. So it's valid. It's unique, I, it never changed. But whatever one you choose, we have to check that it's valid. Yeah, check it. <laughs> it must contain a scheme uh, followed by the authority, a path, and optionally a query string and a fragment. Is this? Yeah. <laughs> So manage, managing dates uh, is also an essential point. Atom formats provides three dates. Published, create, and update. But Atom pub added a new one, the edited date. And although we could, we could think that edited means the same as update, it doesn't. And most, most of the time, they should contain different dates. So updated should be modified uh, when we introduce a significant change. But edited should be brought up to date when we introduce uh, any slight change. For instance, if we are writing a post in our blog and we change a 
comma for a, peri uh, for a period, uh, the edited date should be modified. So data elements are so useful to sort collections. They should be ordered by the edited element with the most recent edited entries coming first in the document. And we also have to ensure that if we modify one of these entries, the feed is properly sorted. So um, what about date formats? They must conform the RFC 3339. So a tick character must be used to separate date and time. And a C character must be present in absence of the numeric time sum offset. So that says, yeah, it works. So and finally, uh, date values should be as accurate as possible. So for example, it would be generally inappropriate for a, publish, for a publishing system to apply the same time as time to several entries. Well, of course, one of the most important aspects to take into account is the entries content format. We must ensure that entries that clients send, as well as we have creating, are well formatted. So each entry must contain a valid ID, a title, an updated date, and an edited date. And on top of this, if we don't provide an, alter an alternate link, we must provide a content. And if this content is not in line or is encoded with base64, we should provide a summary as well. So moreover, we have to check the text elements type. I mean, elements like title, summary, or content can contain hypertext or markup language. And we have to ensure that it's valid, that that doesn't contain cross-site scripts, and, and that the type relative with them are, are is appropriated. So we also have to be extra careful when we manage media resources. When a new resource is done, the server has to create a new entry that represents this resource. And that entry has to be valid. We need to, to fill all, all the elements. And we, al we also have to ensure that the, the atom content include the, the source URL. Because, and well, this, this URL uh, doesn't have to be the same as the edit media URL. And it usually gives you a visible representation of this resource, like a photo, for instance. Yeah. Sorry? Duty? Ah, the encoding. Yeah, we are, so have. No, no. <laughs> we, 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 we have to fill this, this, these elements with something. But now question marks is not UTF, of course. <laughs> yeah, we also have to be careful with question marks. So a tip, a tip is to use the, the Slack header to fill these elements, for instance. Or we can use the, the multi-par media creation, because it, it allows us to to send a, a media file and, and an entry in, in, in one resource. So AtomPub also allows us to categorize resources. There are two types of categories, fixed categories and affixed ones.
Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So fixed categories never change. And we have to ensure that clients don't try to use elements not included in it. So if the server receives an unexpected category, it should respond with an error, with an error code. But unfixed categories can be modified, of course. So if a client adds a category to an entry, we have to check that it's included in the document. If it, if it doesn't already do. So adding new extensions can be tricky as well. So let's be careful. So the, the, the schema in the item syndication format doesn't doesn't provide full validation for feed, cont for, for feed extensions. Rather, this, this schema escapes extension elements. Even when we extensions contains feed or, or other entries. And in consequence, the most common mistake is to forget naming spaces. Nobody puts. So we have to take this into account and we should validate both the feed document and the extension document separately. Well, I have to say that we don't need to write all these tests. There, there are several tools that can help us. And I think if we follow the, the protocol specification, we don't need to implement any functional test because all these, these tools can help us. So the first one is the feed validator. <laughs> so it's, it's a most useful validation tool for feeds. It works uh, with Atom as well as RSS or other formats. And it includes more than 100 test, super, test cases and it recognizes most of the standard namespaces. It's written in Python, and we can also install it locally and run it to our server. It shows the results as an HTML report, and we can find issues that the document contains and how we can solve them. Well, another useful tool is app test client. It's also a, a Python script, and it allows us to test basic aspects of the item path specification. Well, to me, it's, it's killer feature is that you can record the test cases and play it again and again and again. And it generates a tree structure with all the results, including the version numbers, and we can check all these results. And it can as well show the results as an HTML report, and therefore it enables to find the reference of the specification points that our server breaks. Well, if we don't want, if we don't want to play with the command line, we can we can use uh, a desktop test client. So AtomPad test client is, is a testing client that only works on Windows. And I think it's working in Ruby, but it's not open source. So I, I, I don't, I'm not sure. But it's, it's useful because you can manage uh, several services at once. Well, and last but not least, it's the Atom Publishing Exerciser, or the Ape. And in my opinion, it's the, it's the most complete tool to test Atom Pub servers. Uh, it includes more than 50 test cases. Uh, it's not only a testing tool, but also a, an Atom Pub common library. We can, we can create new new application with this library. It's written in, in Ruby, but it works on JRuby as well. And in fact, some test cases use Java libraries, and so depend poorly on JRuby. 
So we, we can we can use the ape from the command line with write tasks like this. Thank you. So, or we can run its inbuilt web server. It's not Rails, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, one of its most valuable asset is that we can ki quite easily extend it. We, g we can add new authentication methods. It's currently supporting basic calls, WSSC, and Google Login. We can create new report formats. Uh, it's currently su uh, supporting text, HTML, or, or Atom reports. And of course, we can add new test cases to, to the app. So let's look at how to add new validators. Oof, I think I have a problem with my. <laughs> Check. I'll turn it works yeah so on the right hand I have an atom pad server installed in the machine mm. locally well and we can find the the service document This is the service document. Uh, it has two collections that accept atom entries. Atom entries. And one more that accepts everything. So on the other hand, I have the source code of the ape, uh, so I can execute break tests. We can read anything, so I can run my web server as well. Thank you. 
So the ape use, uses a, a configuration directory. Uh, it's, it's located in, in the user's home, but we can, we can modify it. And it has a, a config file uh, called apefc. Uh, it's here. Well, in this file, uh, we can we can disable all the default tests if we don't want to use, or we can specify uh, the name of the collection that we are work, uh, that we are going to use. So, if I execute the app with my server. With all the te default tests disabled, I can see some information on the server. So it has two collections that accept item entries and web collection that accept anything. So now I, I can write a new validator for I don't know where it is. Oh. With the demo effect. I'm sorry, but I don't know where this. <laughs> well, here we are. So, if we use TextMate, I, I have some snippets that can help us. Uh, well, a, a validator is just a Ruby class. Did uh, validator uh, requires presence of means what did you want to test? So we can test the ser the service doc, or we can test. Uh, An entry collection, or or even we can specify whoa, whoa, whoa. Oops. well. That's <laughs> so. I'm going. I'm going to test an entry collection. So 
this, this is just a basic test. So I want to show the title. Uh, So if it works fine, uh, the map options uh, should include the, the entry collection. Entry collection. So title. So if I execute it again, so I can see my, my new validator here. Uh, these are a very basic tests. So, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna disable the B always works. I have to restart it. Well, now we, we have uh, taste, uh, we have more info, and well, my my Atom server has six hours uh, and a warning, and we can see it in here, and we can see the the server responses as well. So. That's it. Um, if you have any questions, yeah. So when you were uh, in the, the Ruby validator, yep. you said that it requires validation that requires the presence of media collection. Yeah. Do you want to address the matchup to an element? To to the first to the first media collection that the ape. Okay. Yeah. No. no. So, what's the mapping? Yeah, uh, media collection means a collection that doesn't accept entries, atom entries. Okay. So uh, but you, you can specify uh, just a collection. I, I want to test a collection. You don't need to write entry collection or media collection. Okay. Uh, so, it's any different type of like atom entry, essentially? Yeah. Okay. Uh, entry collections accept atom entries, and media collection doesn't accept okay. atom entries. That's it. Any more? No. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that last final test that you saw, when you turned off the two, uh, yeah. you know, you said disable or whatever. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I have to restart the the eight because the no, the, no, yeah. the the final report yeah. you were getting much more data. Like yeah. It was, it was more than the original yeah. Was that because it's taking No, it's a, it's running all the test cases. Oh, it's just additional test cases. Yeah. Uh, I thought maybe because I know Adam has support for referring to other other Adam URLs. I thought maybe it was like kind of no. Uh, 
What's my background? Yeah, I, I, I started to to build an atom pub service and and need something to to test it. And well, the app was originally written by Tim Bray, and and I'm I'm also one of the developers. No, no, <laughs> no. I, it was just accidentally. Okay. Anything else? No. So, thanks for your attention.